All right. Hello, diplomats. Uh, I'm going to try to go over the notes you're missing while you're trying to solve world peace at case. Uh, so if you look in the notes, this is where we left off. And it was the connection between angular and linear velocity. As long as we don't have slipping involved, we know that this velocity is going to be equal to our radius times our angular velocity. All right, so in the previous part, we've looked at kinematics. We've looked at torque, where we had that torque was equal to how far we are from the pivot point and the force that is perpendicular to it. And we were saying that if everything is balanced, then this is equal to zero. So the net torque on our system balances out. This can be no acceleration or acceleration. In the next part, we're going to move to the second law where for translational, it was F net is equal to MA. Well, our rotational equivalent of force is going to be torque. Our rotational equivalent of mass is going to be the moment of inertia which is going to be how hard it is to spin something, which is going to be capital I, and our rotational acceleration is going to be alpha. So this torque is dependent on having the force and how far it is from the pivot. We can see in our picture here, FA and FB are equal in force, but FA is going to have more torque because it's farther from the pivot. So there's an advantage to having a longer lever arm. We also need to be perpendicular. So if we look at this, FA is going to give us the most torque about this because it's all perpendicular. FC is going to have a part that's perpendicular, but that's only going to be a component of what the force is. FD is not going to provide any torque at all. And your book likes to provide medical examples. So, uh, Here's an example of a muscle providing torque. And the distance from your elbow to where the bicep attaches would be our R, and there is our force that's going up. We can see, though, that as our arm would go down, that this would change that now uh, the muscle is pulling up, but the radius is gonna be at an angle. So that's gonna change what the torque is. All right, so in these, uh, we covered all of these previously. The only one that we haven't gotten to is the 46 one. So we have a uniform plank that's placed with a pivot at its center. Uh, the block is placed on the plank to the left of the pivot, as shown in the figure above. A student is asked to place a second block of greater mass on the plank, so it'll balance when horizontal. Which of the following quantities do we need? So I don't need to know anything about the plank, because all of its weight is going to be at the pivot, and that leaves the mass of the block and the distance from the pivot as what I would need to know. So your book jumps right in and just goes from the second law of translational motion to the second law of rotational. And if you have all of the mass at one given point, so if we're talking about dropping a piece of clay, if we're talking about a moon going around a planet or... Uh, a planet going around the sun, the formula that we're going to use is just going to be mr squared. But if we're talking about a disc or a ball or a rod where the mass isn't all at r, we're going to have different values for this. So this one is on your equation sheet. The other ones you don't have to memorize, but you do need to know which is harder to rotate, which is the lab that we went over. 
So it doesn't just matter what mass you have, but it matters how far it is from the axis. And you guys did uh, a lab with this right before you left that demonstrated this, where you can move the pinballs in or out, and you could see which one made it down the incline faster. So uh, some of these things that you are going to encounter, a disc or a solid cylinder is one half MR squared. A hoop about its middle is the same as the generic one. Why? Because all of the mass is at R. And then a solid sphere is two fifths MR squared. So in the video, he tries to race a solid sphere and a cylinder. And you can see you're comparing one half to two fifths. So those are very close to each other. And then we have the rods that are important. If you're about the middle of the rod, it's going to be 1 12th ML squared. And if you're about an end, it's going to be 1 3rd ML squared. So this is going to be the one uh, we'll look at where we have blades or sometimes it's like swinging a bat. We're saying that it is just a rod that is uniform. All right, so for solving these problems, we have to draw a diagram. It's more than a free body diagram because you also need to know the distance from the axis that are. But the forces are gonna be the same and it's gonna turn out that we can cancel things out and compare them together. So if we look at what we have with our tau net, being equal to I alpha, this is going to be the torques trying to go one way minus the other. I can simplify this to just being R and F. I, we're saying generically, is MR squared, and alpha, we're saying, is A over R. And again, these are all going to be non-slipping examples. So what happens if I simplify this? I get rid of the R's, and I'm going to be able to combine the equation I have for rotation with our linear F net equals MA. All right, so on this problem, you actually have to add in that our friction is 6.6 .6 newtons. And we're going to figure out what our F net equals MA acceleration is and what our alpha acceleration is. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the forces where they're acting on this ball, because that's gonna be important for rotation. So a force that's rotating something has to be a certain distance away from the axis, and it also has to be perpendicular. So my three forces here, the first one, mg, is at the axis. I would say that the weight is acting at the center of mass. So that cannot provide a torque. My second one is normal, which is perpendicular to my surface. This one is a distance from the axis, but since it's perpendicular to the surface, that makes it parallel to the radius. That also cannot provide a torque. And so that leaves our final force which is going to be friction, which is going to cause this to roll. The interesting thing here is that to roll is going to take longer than to slide because you're going to have this friction, but this friction does not dissipate energy. It does not cause loss of energy. In order for friction to cause loss of energy, you have to be pushing past something, not rolling on top of it. So there's no sliding past, so that's not going to cause it to lose energy to friction, to heat. So I'm gonna rotate this. And now it's just the weight that's at an angle. And then I know that my incline, which is 30, is gonna be this upper angle here. So I'm gonna have mg sine of 30 that goes down the incline. And so I'm going to take this one dimensional direction to be my positive direction because that's how my system's going to accelerate. So I'm going to say F net equals MA. My positive force is going to be MG sine of 30. 
my negative force is friction by itself, and I'm able to solve for what my acceleration is. So mg sine of 30 is going to be 20. 20 minus 6.6 .6 is going to be 13.4. 13.4 divided by 4. I cannot do in my head. It's 3.35. All right, uh, my rotational inertia is just going to be this divided by the radius. So my radius is 0.5, and so I'm going to have 3.35 divided by 0.5, which is 6.7. If I want to get the speed at the end, I'm going to make a chart. I'm going to say its initial velocity is 0. Its final velocity is unknown. My linear velocity, my tangential velocity is 3.35. And I know my distance. They're telling us that it is 10 meters long. So I have enough right there. I know that V squared is going to be equal to V naught squared plus 2A X minus X naught V naught zero. So I have 2 times 3.35 meters per second squared times 10. So if it were to slide down, its acceleration would have been 5. So that friction does slow it down, but not by the reason that we normally think. So that's going to be 8.2. All right, so uh, what we did in class is we calculated what just the moment of inertia was for this system. I have two masses. I have a five kilogram mass. I have a seven kilogram mass. And they are four meters apart from each other. And I considered one axis that they would rotate about. The axis that's in the middle of the two of them. So each one of them would be two meters apart. Then I'm going to consider an axis that's to the left of the five kilogram one by a half of a meter. So it's going to end up being four and a half meters from that axis. And so all I have to do is add up what these moments of inertia is. So my I total is just going to be I1 plus I2. So this is going to be M1, R1 squared, plus M2, R2 squared. So for the first one, this is going to be 5 times 2 squared plus 7 times 2 squared. And we can see the distance is playing a bigger effect than the mass is. So I have 20 plus 28, which would be 48. This doesn't have a nice clean unit, so it's kind of like momentum in that way where it's going to be kilograms, meters squared. All right, so from the other axis, the one that's 0.5 away, I'm going to have 5. And now this one is 0.5 squared. But this 7 kilogram one is 4.5 away. That's a good distance. So this one I would expect to be a lot more. So that ends up being 143 kilograms meters per second. So that the same two masses could have drastically different moments of inertia.
All right, so uh, the lab that they're starting today that you guys will see when you get back is having a cord just wrapped around a pulley. And we're going to compare how hard it is to accelerate it. So I have a 15 Newton force applied to a cord wrapped around a heavy pulley of mass four kilograms. The pulley accelerates uniformly from rest to an angular speed of 30 radians per second in three seconds. If there is a frictional torque of 1.1, determine the moment of inertia. So I need to identify what type of problem I have. And I have, second, I have a second law problem for torque. I have a constant torque that's going to be from both this force that's going down, that's 15, but also there's a frictional torque of 1.1 Newton meters that's going to be acting in the opposite direction. So I'm going to say that this is going to win out. This 15 Newton is going to win out. And so I'm going to take things that turn it that way to be positive. So this is going to be R times F minus the frictional torque that they actually give to us. And so that torque from the 15 Newton force minus our frictional torque divided by our rotational acceleration will be what the moment of inertia is of this pulley. So if, if it's not uniform in shape, and the one we're using uh, for the lab isn't uniform in shape, it looks like the hats like the Devo band wore. So I'm going to plug in my values. This is going to be 0.33 meters. The force applied is 15 newtons. My frictional torque is 1.1. And then my acceleration, it tells me that I'm going to 30 radians per second in three seconds. So this is going to be the change in angular velocity over time, which just ends up being 30 over 3, which is 10. And so this moment of inertia is 0.385 kilograms meter squared. So again, weird unit, weird unit for this, but it takes into account both the mass and how far it's located away from the axis. All right. What does this look like on the AP test? This is an example of a multiple choice. Two blocks of mass, masses M1 and M2 are connected by a massless string that passes over a wheel of mass M as shown above. The string does not slip on the wheel and exerts forces T1 and T2 on the blocks. When the wheel is released from rest in the position shown, it undergoes an angular acceleration and rotates clockwise. Which of the following statements about T1 and T2 is correct? If we're talking about something spinning, it is going to accelerate because it has a net torque. And that net torque has to be from this force. They're both the same distance away, right? We're saying this is in the center. So we're really comparing which one is a bigger force. And because it's rotating that way and getting faster, T2 is greater than T1. This is a good example of one where uh, the force stays in the same position, but it's perpendicular amount or it's perpendicular distance from the radius changes. So uh, this is falling straight down. It would have a weight that's acting straight down the middle of the rod, but this is not acting perpendicular to the rod right? So my R is here, and this is at an angle. So since, and I'll make it bigger, we have the MG that is going straight down. We have our R that's going down to the pivot. I'm interested in what this force is, 
but I only care about the part that is perpendicular. So that's this component here. And what's going to happen is as this pivots and goes down, R stays the same, the distance from where this force is acting to the center. But when we get totally horizontal, now the force that's causing the torque is not just a component, it is all of it. So my acceleration needs to be changing, getting bigger, and so does my angular velocity. So it's E. All right, so uh, a bat. A bat is going to be a rod that is pivoted about an end. So this is going to be one third ml squared. And then my acceleration is just going to be my change in angular velocity over time. The torque is going to be the product of these two. So I have one third ml squared times the change in angular velocity over time. So that's going to be one third. My bat is 0.9. My length is 0.95. This is changing from 2.6 revolutions per second. So I have to convert that to radians. And then I'm going to divide the whole thing by 0.2. I got 22.11. And since that's a torque, it's going to be a Newton meter, right? So we're talking about a vector product that results in another vector. All right, in class, I let the students pick which axis they wanted to pivot this about to find out what the moment of inertia would be, the X or the Y. Uh, if we pick our X axis, then all of our distances will be the same. They'll all be 0.25. And so my I total, and I'm going to have to hurry up because this is only allowed to be a half hour. is going to be the sum of all of these. So I'm going to end up with MR squared plus MR squared plus big MR squared plus big MR squared. And so I just need to plug in big M, little m, and the R. But I'm going to go to the next problem so we get through it before Screencastify cuts me off. All right. Uh, and then the last one from today, we considered the rotor for a plane, and this is going to be not just one rod being pivoted about an end, but three. So my torque is going to be this moment of inertia times my angular velocity. So my moment of inertia is one-third ml squared, but I have three of them. And so I'm going to have 3 times 1 third times 135 kilograms times 3.75 meters squared. And again, they're giving us what our initial angular velocity is in revolutions per second, but I need it to be in radians. So that's going to be 12 pi. And then this is happening in eight seconds. So 
So I have 89.46 Newton meters. Sounds about right. All right, looks like I have a couple minutes left, so I'll go back to the previous slide and see if we can crunch these numbers. So this is going to simplify to 2 mr squared plus 2 big mr squared. And again, we're saying that each of these is 0.25 from this axis. These are 3.4 kilograms. They're also 0.25 away. So I'm going to plug this in. And I have 0.7 kilograms meter squared. And obviously, it's going to be different if you picked the y-axis. All right, guys. Good luck.